Awesome. Thank you so much, Olivia. And as Olivia stated, my name is Philip Springfield, and I serve as the manager of Health Center Operations Training here with the NACS Training and Technical Assistance Division. And I'm glad to have you all with us for our January Telehealth Office Hour session. Uh, before we get started, I do have a couple of quick commercial breaks in here just to make sure you're all aware of our upcoming events. Um, and first things first, as always, I'd like to give a shout out to our NAC hosted EHR user groups. As you can see on the left hand side of the slide, NAC currently hosts uh, six EHR user groups amongst different vendors. Um, these groups are led by a steering committee of PCA, ACCN, and co Central leaders on a voluntary basis. And of course, we would always encourage you to join. Uh, if you would like, you can always email me, and we'll make sure to drop in the chat a link to get there as well. Uh, moving on, I also wanted to give another reminder that is EHR related. We actually just opened up the application for our EHR Learning Collaborative. And this year, it's going to be focused on EHR optimization. And a special feature about this is that it is going to be vendor agnostic. So anyone on any EHR is going to be able to apply for this. And it's really aimed at making real changes within your organization and learning real strategies on how to do that. Um, so I'll make sure to put in the, the link to the application there as well. In case folks have any questions, you can always email me. Um, and then next things next, for our coders and our quality folks, we do have a building coding documentation and quality webinar series coming up later this year. Um, a special feature about this is that if you attend both, you can earn up to three CEUs um, by attending both of those webinars. So we do have the top five documentation and revenue tips in community health. And on January 31st, we'll be looking at treating substance and opioid use disorder via medicated assistive treatment in community health. Uh, we definitely look forward to seeing you there. And then just lastly, I wanted to give you all a plug that there are some innovative telehealth uh, tools that we have coming out of a joint project for uh, FQAP. Uh, so as you see on this slide, what you will also get um, is a uh, tool that you can look at for policy, the policy tracker across 50 states. And then you also have questions. If you do have specific telehealth building questions, you can email FQHC questions at cchpca.org. Um, we'll definitely be learning and hearing more information about that later on throughout today's webinar. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get things started. We are done with the commercial break. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be introducing our partner today with Center for Connected Health Policy, Nate Fong, who's going to be coming with us with the latest and greatest telehealth policy updates that are going to be impacting you this year. Uh, so without further ado, I want to just thank May again for her time and pass it over to get started. Thanks again. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, NAC, for inviting me here today. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. As Philip said, my name is Meg Hall. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. For those who may not be familiar with CCHP, we are the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. What that all means is we receive federal funding to provide technical assistance on telehealth policy questions. So we are national, so we cover what happens both on the federal level and on the state level. And today, I'll be mainly focusing on what has happened on the federal level because there's actually been some recent actions that directly impact um, clinics as well. So I just wanted to keep you informed on that. But I will be touching upon a couple of things that will be impacting states as well. However, as Philip showed on the previous screen, um, because there are 50 states, actually we track not only the 50 states, but District of Columbia, the Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico as well. So we track 53 jurisdictions, not counting the federal uh, landscape as well. So as Philip mentioned on the previous slide, we do have a policy finder on our 50 state policy finder, um, a section devoted to FQHCs and Medicaid telehealth policies. And because there are 53 different jurisdictions, there are 53 different policies for Medicaid and telehealth as they impact FQHC. So I really encourage you to go and use that to figure out like what's going on in your particular area, in your particular state, or if you cover, cover multiple states or multiple jurisdictions, you'll be able to figure that out as well too, or go to those different ones because it is very different. Um, but for the most part, we're going to focus on federal, which is a little bit easier to follow. 
theoretically, because it's one policy. And when I say theoretically, you'll understand as I get more into it, it's just sort of there's like a few different tracks going on and a few different things going on that might make things a little confusing. So hopefully I'll be able to like clarify and make it a little bit easier for folks to understand exactly what is going on and where we are now. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer here, because we are federally funded, they like me, the feds like me doing this. So I am not providing anybody with legal advice. This is strictly for informational purposes only. CCHP always recommends that if you are interested in a formal legal opinion, that you consult with legal counsel. Also, if I happen to mention a company or show a picture or a product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of you know, arrangement or relationship or affiliation with such a company. So this slide, if you've heard me talk before, you've probably seen this slide at some point. And this is my sort of quick one slide summary of like the telehealth policy changes that happened during COVID-19, both on the federal and the state level. And it's it's like very, very broad and overview. As you can see, not a lot of detail in there. But what it does show you are the certain areas where there were temporary changes made in response to the pandemic. And you see some overlap or at least some commonalities between what was happening on the federal level and what was happening on the state level as far as issues that they are addressing. And the reason for that is because a lot of the established telehealth policies that impeded the use of telehealth in response to COVID-19 were around certain um, elements or certain common elements that they had both on the federal and state level, such as, you know, limitation on where the patient had to be when a telehealth service took place. So like a geographic limitation or a site limitation, the modality you can use if you're expecting to get reimbursed by um, either Medicare or Medicaid, and also the type of provider could provide the service and the type of services that are covered. So those were sort of common issues that both state governments and the federal government had to address if they wanted telehealth to be used more, more widely. But then there were all the all the um, other issues that were exclusively on the federal or on the state level to decide. So, for example, licensure, that's like a state issue. So the states were deciding what they were going to do with it. But HIPAA, for example, it's a federal issue. So the feds were deciding what to do with it. So this is just sort of your sort of quick overview of what, what, what had happened in response to COVID-19. And the question is, what's going to stay? What's going to remain? once we're out of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Now, on the state side of things, a lot of states have actually made that decision already. So, but they've all done different things. Again, that's why I encourage you to go to the CCHP policy finder because I, I can't tell you like, oh, this is what happened and apply to all 50 states because they all did different things. They all did different approaches. Some of them may have been similar in like their approach, but it, there's variations, um, you know, little tweaks and things that really make a difference to be aware of. So a lot of states have already decided what they were going to do after the public health emergency, or they were on a track where their waivers were based upon a state public health emergency, and that's been over, you know, for a couple of months or maybe even a year or longer. So as I said, so states have already moved towards, for the most part, their decision on what they're doing in regards to telehealth. The feds are a different story. So the feds have, over these last couple of years, gone through a lot of different things or a lot of different approaches. So for the most part, it's just been delayed because we've remained in a public health emergency. But there have been some movement that gave will give us an idea of what it's going to look like after the public health emergency is declared over. Now, where, where are we with the public health emergency itself? So we are still in a, in a public health emergency, and it was actually just renewed again yesterday. So right now, we know we will still be underneath the public health emergency through April. And a lot of people feel like this is probably it. This is probably the last public health emergency renewal. Once we hit April 11th around there, that's going to be it. We're out of a public health emergency. And technically, without, without that public health emergency declaration, a lot of waivers, a lot that we um, experienced during COVID-19 will disappear unless some action has been taken by the federal government to keep it around or to make it permanent. Now, the way the federal government will do that will be through two steps. So they either will do it through legislation. So a uh, bill will have to pass Congress, the president will have to sign it, and beca it becomes law, or they will do it administratively or through a regulatory process. And that's CMS, basically, 
when we're talking about a lot of the med, um, a lot of the telehealth policy on the federal level because it impacts Medicare. So something that the administrating agency, such as CMS, would need to decide and to go through a regulatory process. Now, over the last almost three years that since we've been in the public health emergency, there have been various movements both on the legislative side and on the regulatory side as I said, to give us an idea of what this post-PHE landscape is going to look like for telehealth on the federal level. On the legislation side, there have three, been three major pieces of legislation, and basically it's been not a telehealth bill. It's been more of a budget or appropriations act. So it's been a bigger bill with stuff in there that telehealth got woven into. And <laughs> It usually takes place towards the end of the year, although 2022 was the beginning of 2022. So it usually takes place around this time of year, like December, January, that type of, of timing as far as like when these particular bills have passed. So there was one in 2021. Now, the one in 2021, some of you may be familiar with it, it didn't actually address any of the temporary waivers, but it created that permanent policy of, oh, we'll allow telehealth to be used to provide mental health services um, if certain conditions are uh, without the geographic requirement being applied and it can take place in the home, if certain conditions are met, and one of those conditions was having a prior in-person visit with the telehealth provider. So that's that's where that came from. It came from like the Budget Act or the Appropriations Act of 2021 that, um, you know, uh, that they passed in Congress. Then in 2022, we saw what was called the, I called it the 151 day grace period, where they did address the temporary waivers, where they said, you know, what we're going to do now is when the public health emergency is declared over, we're going to create this sort of basically grace period for some, some of the telehealth waivers. And that's 151 day grace period. So you may have also heard that too, that number being bandied around of like, oh, well, we've got like 151 day after the public health emergency where some of this telehealth, these telehealth waivers will stick around. Now they didn't do all of them. So this was legislation and what basically what they included in there was that certain providers can continue to provide services via telehealth during this grace period. And those, that included FQHCs and RHCs and a couple other specialists. They did waive the geographic limitation. They also allowed the home to continue to be an eligible rich site. And they said that audio only can continue to be used. So we had this grace period now established and we knew, okay, so when the public health emergency is declared over, we're going to have 151 days with some of these things. Now, I keep stressing some because they did not address all the waivers. You'll see on here, for example, HIPAA wasn't addressed. For those who may not be familiar, when the pandemic started, the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, which oversees HIPAA, said that they would exercise discretion on whether to, to prosecute or, or ding a, a person who was not abiding by HIPAA because they wanted uh, providers to be able to like utilize whatever platform was available as quickly as possible, and they may not have been HIPAA compliant. So they said that they basically were, would not go after anyone. Um, if they if they were using like a platform that wasn't quite compliant, that kind of discretion or that kind of that memo basically will expire um, once the PHE is over because it was not woven into this federal bill here. So it wasn't in legislation, and that's just one of one of like a couple of things that they did not specify in like federal legislation. So. For going into 22, at the start of 22, we knew we had a 151-day grace period after the PHE for at least some of these things. Fast forward to uh, basically right before Christmas of 2022 in December, they passed another budget bill, essentially. It's Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2023. And what they said was, for those temporary waivers that we talked about with that 151-day grace period, period, we are now extending them for two years. So they will end not 151 days after the PHG, but on December 31st, 2024. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on exactly what all that means instead of just these like little bullets that I have here. So as I said, these are the things that are going to be extended stick around for an additional two years, essentially, till December 31st, 2024. And that is the location. So basically, the geographic requirement is not going to apply in Medicare. Keep in mind, I am just talking about Medicare policy. 
in Medicare, that geographic requirement is not going to apply. They're also going to continue to allow the home to be an eligible originating site. Now, permanent Medicare policy, for those who aren't familiar, it says that the patient needs to be in a certain geographic location and the home is not an eligible originating site, except for certain very narrow exceptions. Right now, underneath the temporary waiver, that, that is suspended basically for two years until December 31st, 2024. They're also going to continue to allow some providers who are not eligible providers underneath the permanent Medicare policies for telehealth to continue to be able to provide services via telehealth and get reimbursed by Medicare. And those are PTs and OTs, audiologists, and speech language pathologists. FQHCs and RHCs, and this is where it's important for you, will also continue to be able to provide services via telehealth. Again, under permanent Medicare telehealth policies, FQHCs and RHCs are not eligible providers, but this during this two-year temporary waiver period until December 31st, 2024, you will still continue to be eligible to provide those services via telehealth and get reimbursed by Medicare. Keep in mind, though, that the services that you provide, it's not all your services, it's only going to be the services that are eligible to be provided via telehealth in the Medicare program. Audio only can continue to be used to provide certain services beyond like mental health services. So right now underneath permanent policy, um, mental health and behavioral health services will be the only ones that you can use audio only to uh, provide and still get reimbursed by Medicare. The temp again, the temporary waivers, the COVID waivers allowed other services to, to be used or audio only to be used to provide those other services beyond mental behavioral health. But they're very specific. And for, for those who are not familiar, CMS does have like a list of like what are all the eligible telehealth delivered services. And then they look, mark out like these are the ones, it's not all of them, these are the ones that you can use audio only for. They are delaying implementation of some of the permanent policies that they made decisions to do earlier and such as what I mentioned um, in the previous slide about the, uh, in-person mental health, uh, in-person visit before a mental health service can be provided without the geographic restriction taking place. So, so that's been delayed. That's been delayed till January 1st, 2025. So basically they're not implementing that when we're in this now two-year grace period. There was also a delay of um, having audio only to require that in-person visit as well too. That was something that CMS has decided administratively uh, with a physician fee schedule a little uh, ways back. Um, that's also been delayed. So, so you don't have to worry about like, oh, do, does telehealth provider need to have this prior in-person visit? That's been delayed. That's been delayed two years as well too. The thing that is like a little bit newer is they re are requiring a study on telehealth that will look at data gathered from basically like this grace period that they're creating from like 2022 to 2024 and looking at various factors of telehealth like utilization and also, you know, where it happened, etc. And the interim report of that will be due towards the end of the grace period, October 1st of 2024, and then the final report in 2026. And then there was some concern about this, an extension on the safe harbor for the absence of a deductible telehealth, um, and it got cut a little bit cut off here. So there was, uh, during the COVID-19, um, during the pandemic and public health emergency, there was a safe harbor went on deductibles for telehealth, on uh, commercial plans too, so they're, they're continuing that as well too. So as I said, not everything was in here for an extension for two years that applied to telehealth that were temporary waivers in response to COVID-19. These are major things. I, I don't want to like, you know, um, uh, downplay this. These are major things that they are extending for an additional two years, but not everything is in here. Physician fee schedule. Now, this is the other way I said that they will make permanent policy. So that was all legislation, but CMS also um, has a role in deciding what would be permanent policy going forward too. And they do this through the regulatory process through the physician fee schedule. For those who are not familiar with it, the physician fee schedule is 
the set of proposals that CMS comes out with every year that impacts Medicare for the following year. So they usually come out with it in summer around July. There's like a 60, uh, about a 60 day comment period where the public can like, you know, respond to what the proposals are. They take that in, they respond back, and then they make a permanent decision on uh, a final proposal, usually published in like November, sometimes as um, late as early December. And then they say, this is the final policy and it's going to go into effect January 1st the following year unless they give a different date for when it goes into effect. Now what they have done over the last couple of years is they've done sort of incremental changes as well to as far as what they're going to make for permanent policy. So one of the things they did was they created a temporary holding bucket. It's called category three and these were um, services that CMS decided that they would continue to reimburse if telehealth was used to provide it, but it wasn't a permanent policy yet. So they put them in a temporary holding bucket to decide um, after they've gathered more evidence to see should it be moved over to the permanent list. It's called category three, that's how they labeled it. Now this temporary holding bucket only goes through 2023 until the end of 2023. So, that has a specific date on there. Now, that's your first clue there of seeing like, there may be now a misalignment of policies because you're saying like, well, wait a minute, we have like all these all these um, temporary policies that you just said in the previous section that go to 2024. Yes, but keep in mind that happened just a few weeks ago in December and it was a congressional action. CMS does things as well. And so far they have not made any changes yet. So I'm only going by like what I know has happened so far and what has happened is they created this category three. It contains some of the COVID-19 services or services you can provide during the COVID-19 pandemic um, when you're using telehealth. And they said that they will only be eligible or available until the end of 2023. Now, other permanent policy they changed, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's um, allowing FQHCs and RHCs to use audio only and live video to provide mental and behavioral health services. But it, if certain conditions are met, such as having that in-person visit, that's suspended. That is definitely suspended. It was That was suspended by the, the congressional bill. But at least suspended until um, uh, the January 1st, 2025. So it's in that two-year like grace period there. But the other thing that hasn't quite been aligned yet with like what happened with the congressional action was basically the list of eligible telehealth services. So when COVID-19 happened, um, CMS put on the list of services that you can provide via telehealth and get reimbursed by them. Other, other services that were eligible that weren't on the permanent telehealth list. So uh, there was about 150 eligible services you can provide via telehealth underneath the Medicare program that are on the permanent list. And then CMS added like another 100 during the pandemic. Um, some of those they have said they're going to be category three. They marked them as category three. So we know that they stick around until 2023. What happened when last year Congress created the 151-day grace period in the physician fee schedule, CMS aligned their policy as far, as far as like what services will be available during that time or that you can do during that grace period to reflect that 151-day grace period. So, so let me, that's a little bit confusing, so I'll go over it again. So in the congressional bill, both the one for last year that created the 151 day grace period and the one that created and extended it to two years, what you will notice in there is Congress did not say anything really about what are eligible services to be covered via telehealth during that time. That's because that is for the most part left up to CMS to decide. There's some very specific things that, that are allowed, but that's like kind of what CMS had on their permanent list. So that was never in, in, in question. It's all those like additional services that CMS added during the, the public health emergency. That's the big question mark. So the question has always been that since Congress did not address that, what will happen? Can you still continue to provide all that big list of services, basically 250, 250 different CPT codes, CPT codes, or do we go back to like the permanent list, which is a smaller list? CMS, with through the regulatory process over the last couple of years, has said 
There's one category, category three, that has some of those codes that we know will stick around until 2023. And then last year they said, oh no, the entire list will stick around during the 151 day grace period. Again, we go back to the congressional bill is pretty recent. CMS has not like come out with anything yet. They may not have had time yet to come out with something to respond to that. So my guess is at some point they are going to align themselves to like the two year to your grace period now and not just keep it at 151 days, but nothing has come out yet. So I can only say that, well, we know there's going to be 151 days that that full list will stick around. I, I, I can't speak for CMS. I'm assuming they're going to align with what the congressional action has taken place. But right now, until they do that, I can only say there's the 151 day grace period. We'll see what happens. Um, in fairness to CMS, this has only been a few weeks since that bill was passed, and it was like right before the holidays. And also CMS doesn't really need to do anything right now because we're still underneath the public health emergency. So this hasn't really quite kicked in yet because we're still underneath PHE. So they may feel okay because they have a little bit of time, at least we know through April, before they like issue that policy. So it's a little bit confusing, but just keep in mind they're because they were doing this process of like on policy on different, they do it through different channels that they're just not quite aligned on everything yet. I'm sure we'll hear like, you know, something about what they're going to do soon. Um, my, the only concern is the timing because people think that we only have, this was our last public health emergency renewal um, and it only goes through April. And if they are hoping to do their do it through the physician fee schedule usual process, that usually doesn't take place until the summer. So there's going to be a gap there. So one thing that they can do is just probably do like an emergency sort of regulation or I don't know, maybe the public health emergency will get extended a couple more times, but I don't know. But right now, just know that the, as I said, they haven't quite aligned their policies yet, but it's also been very soon. It's only been a couple of weeks. So we got to give them a little bit of time. And they do have like the, 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 the cushion of having had the public health emergency renewed again for like another 90 days. So they have some time to do that. Hopefully that made sense. When we get to Q&A, I can like go through it again if necessary. So this is sort of like your kind of quick glance as, as to like where all these things align. That's why I was saying like, you know, things are kind of like all on different tracks. So the first column is like your permanent policy. This this is stuff like no matter what, if we're in a PHE or we're now suddenly January 1st, 2025, this is the stuff that sticks around that we know of so far. Um, keep in mind, I mean, stuff changes. So there could be like another bill passed this year and it like completely changes everything that I have on the slide. So it is like very important to keep track of these things. Um, you could, if you don't want to do that on your own, just sort of like sign up for stuff for CC from CCHP and definitely from NAC and we can keep you informed of things. But this is sort of like your quick glance as to like, you know, what's permanent policy? What automatically goes away once the PHE is over? Now, let's take a look at that. What automatically goes away? The things that we know, and there's other things that will automatically go away that I didn't list here, but these are kind of like some of the bigger things that people have asked about. So one is that HIPAA discretion that I talked about, and OCR actually was pretty clear about that. They have an, it's kind of buried, they have like an FAQ where they have like a link saying like, oh no, once the public health emergency is over, that discretionary thing goes away. So yeah, you better be HIPAA compliant. Um, also, the PHE exception prescribing controlled substances. A lot of people are very confused about this. So underneath the Ryan Hate Act, which includes the section on telehealth and prescribing controlled substances, there's a list of exceptions on where you can use telehealth without having the telehealth provider have that in-person visit with the patient. And those exceptions are pretty narrow, and a lot of them basically boils down to like, oh, the patient needs to be in a DEA registered facility or they need to be with a DEA licensed provider during the time of telehealth visit. One of those ex exceptions, though, was when a public health emergency is declared. So when the COVID-19 public health emergency was declared, that kicked in automatically. That was not something that Congress decided to do in response to COVID-19. It was something already in federal law and it just kicked in automatically. But what that also means is once that public health emergency is declared over, it automatically works for it's back to like, you gotta fall into one of those other narrow exceptions. It automatically goes away. So unless something is done, that for the most part it automatically goes away. There's gonna be, except for one potential avenue, 
uh, well, two potential avenues. I'll talk about that in the next slide. But for, for the most part, it's like, that's going to be something that disappears automatically, like day after public health emergency is declared over. Post PhD, what we know will stick around for the two years. It's all that stuff that I talked about earlier, but you'll see I have an asterisk at the bottom saying like right now the eligible list of services so in CMS and Medicare not quite aligned with this policy yet. So that's still talking about being in a 151 day grace period. So as I said, I anticipate probably CMS doing something soon. I, I can't guarantee it, but they aligned it with like the previous legislation for the 150 day grace period. So that's why I'm assuming they're going to align it with the two year period. And then what do we know will be here through the um, year of the end of the PHE? That's those category three services. And this was assuming that the PHE is declared over this year in 2023. So the end, um, the category three services that I mentioned, you know, sticking around and being in that temporary holding bucket CMS created, and also virtual preference for direct su supervision. So during COVID-19, CMS allowed supervision um, by physicians to take place through through telehealth, through virtual presence. Um, that was a temporary waiver. So they have asked for feedback on like, should we continue this? And they haven't made a final decision on that yet. So we're, we're under CCHP, the assumption that it's over unless some policy change happens in the meantime. And that could happen. I did a recording about like what to expect after the PhD in the beginning of December. And it, it definitely was is now outdated information because of this congressional action. A couple of other things that have happened, and this is um, the first one, relates to the prescribing controlled substance. There have been proposed regulations put out by SAMHSA that, said, that is trying to make permit the initiation of buprenorphine um, to be provided via audio only or, or live video if you are an opiate treatment program physician, PCP, or other, other healthcare professional that can do that though. So that's like a narrow exception. So, but keep in mind, that's not all controlled substances. It is buprenorphine and it's a very specific circumstance, like a very specific type of provider too. But that is a proposed regulation that is out there as well. And then the other thing, and this is where I'm gonna to touch upon the states a little bit, is that um, for those who may not be familiar, there is something called e-consult that has been used over the last couple of years. And it is basically, um, Patient goes and sees their primary care provider. Uh, there is some condition that they have that the primary care provider needs to consult with a specialist. And they send that information, like very robust, a lot of information over to a specialist. And the specialist sends you know, their recommendations back to the primary care provider. And then the primary care provider essentially initiates and does the treatment. So the 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 care stays with like the primary care provider. It's usually primary care provider, but I'm using that as an example. And that's called, e, been labeled e-consult. There's been a question there um, on whether Medicaid programs can reimburse for that. And, and basically still, the, the big thing is basically still do that underneath their federal match there, have that partially paid by the federal government. But, um, and there's been a lot of like confusion over that. There's been sort of like mixed messages from the feds on like, you know, is that covered? And and states have been doing different things. Well, a letter was sent out um, last week from CMS where they said, yes, Medicaid programs can cover that, you know, um, it's not mandated. So that doesn't mean like Medicaid programs, you are obligated to cover this. It is something that Medicaid programs um, can cover. That's what the CMS letter is saying. And um, they also would need to, depending on like their fee structure or something, they may need to send in a state plan amendment. So I only bring this up because of a couple of things. First off, you will notice this did not was not a regulatory process nor was this legislation. This was an administrative letter that CMS sent to the states. So that is another way in which policy can be developed that impacts how telehealth is used, that can impact clinics as well. Second thing, it's great that they did this clarity, but, and I have the letter link, that's why that's hyperlinked. So when you get a copy of the slides, you can read the letter yourself. I have a couple of questions. There's a couple of points to the letter that were a little bit unclear to me. Um, so I will probably be trying to follow up with CMS. I don't know if they'll answer my questions, but I'll follow up with CMS with like some clarity. One of them is I'm, I'm not actually not quite sure um, how they are regarding uh, clinics being allowed to, to uh, use e-consult and get reimbursed for it by their Medicaid program. So I'm hoping to get a little clarity on that. But this is a good step forward in that it is 
basically saying because there was so much uncertainty of like, well, can state Medicaid programs do this? I mean, what's going on here for for CMS to like put this forward and you know clear that up at least. But again, I said it's it's another sort of way of policy being established that impacts you guys and as far as like how you use telehealth and it's not an obvious piece it's not like a piece of legislation that congress passes or even like the physician fee schedule it's like this other piece but it can be a very important piece as well too so just wanted to put that on your radar so you're aware of it as well um and i think that's about it here is the cchp website we also do a weekly newsletter where we put out like sort of like break news and information regarding things and I think there are some questions that I'm just going to click on the Q&A and just start looking at and see. Um, legislation applies to Medicare only. Yes. So if you're interested in Medicaid or commercial health plan, that's really more in the state level. So you're going to have to look at what the state does regarding that. For behavioral health patients who may not have been seen in person, they are not eligible for telehealth? No. So that's where I know a lot of confusion lies. So that policy where, where CMS said like, oh, before you use telehealth um, to provide services, uh, mental and behavioral health services, you need to have an in-person visit. Now that permanent policy, don't worry about it now for the next two years. It's been delayed. But there's also confusion about the policy itself to begin with. In Medicare, to, in order for, for a service to be eligible to be reimbursed by Medicare, the patient needs to be in a certain location, both geographically and like site, like the type of building they're in when the telehealth service takes place. Now, underneath that permanent policy, you need to be in a rural location. They have a very specific type of definition for what they mean by rural. The in-person mental health visit requirement will only kick in if you're trying to avoid that geographical requirement or if the patient is trying to have the service in the home. That's when that in-person requirement takes place. So you as a clinic, if a patient came into your clinic and you were connecting them with a telehealth provider for mental health services, they didn't need to have that in-person requirement met. You just needed to to have fit into like that geographic requirement there. So, so yeah, so that does not kick in for two years, but also it was more if you were trying to avoid like other types of requirements, this is just the geographical requirement that you're required to have the in-person one. Um, we are in South Carolina. I have an MP that is going to do AWVs via telehealth. The patient will come to the office. The MP will be at her home. Her home is in Georgia. Can we bill for the AWV? what payer so it's going to vary from payer to payer it, it, if it's medicare you're going to have to like look at the Medi medicare policies to see like is the particular service going to be reimbursed is like the um nurse practitioner like an eligible provider so it, it, and then if it's medicaid those same questions come up on uh, as well so it's going to, your first point to start with is who who is the payer who covers that patient who who's paying for that particular visit and then see what their policies are for there what constitutes an in-person visit our telehealth providers are not on site however patients are required to be in the clinic observed by managed care majority of their visits so the in-person visit i'm assuming you're talking about that prior in-person visit there was actually some specificity by cms about that what they were talking about they were saying that it is an in-person visit that they need to have with that telehealth provider and the service that was provided is actually some service that cms paid for or would have paid for had the patient been eligible for medicare so that is what they mean by that and it's very very specific um, okay, our FQHC is in Indiana. A behavioral health patient goes to Arizona for the winter. Will Medicare cover a telehealth visit with our BH provider patients located in another state? Your first issue is actually around licensure. It's not going to be around Medicare. So the question is, is like, can you provide that visit when the patient is in another state? That is going to vary. So it's going to depend on what controls is, is location of the patient. And when I say what controls, I mean, what controls is their licensure laws. So whatever state that they're going to, you're going to need to like figure out what their licensure laws say. Now, some states have made exceptions, not all states. Some states have made exceptions, such as 
if they're here, you know, um, temporarily, it's fine to do that. Or if you only do it a couple of times a year, it's, it's okay for you to do that. You don't need to get a license from our state. Not all states do that. You need to um, look at that and see what happens. Now, I see that you followed up and saying, like, the licensure is fine. Is like, is Medicare going to cover the visit? Um, they should because they, as long as you are abiding by the the licensure, and also for definitely for like the two year period, um, the originating site requirements have been a little have, as I said, been waived. Um, so it it's. It should be covered, is what I'm thinking, because they you don't necessarily the patient doesn't. I'm thinking on the patient end, it's like they don't have to be in a clinic setting at this point, because as I said, they are allowing home to be an eligible originating site during like the public health emergency and also during the the co uh, the two year grace period. So it should as the biggest problem, and this is for other folks, it may not apply to your situation, but the biggest problem is really the licensure issue that you're going to run into. So does the call, call, uh, Consolidated Appropriation Act supersede the 150-day extension period in the context of the permanent health services made eligible because of the PHE? I'm not quite sure I completely understand that question, but the first part of it, does it supersede it? Yes. So the 151-day grace period essentially no longer applies except for the list of eligible services. And again, I go back to it's because CMS hasn't quite aligned it. They may not have had time to like align their policies to what happened in Congress. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean in the context of permanent telehealth services made eligible because of the PHE. So there, so there have been some, okay, so there have been some services, maybe this is what you mean. Over the last three years, there have been some services that were temporarily allowed during COVID-19 on that list that CMS has made permanent. There's been a handful. There has not been a lot. It's maybe been about 20 or 25 different service codes that were put onto the permanent telehealth list. So yeah, so those would like stick around no matter what. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's what you're asking about, but if it is, whatever happens, 51 day grace, 151 day grace period, two year grace period, or in a PHE, not in a PHE, what's on the permanent list um, that sticks. So yeah, so I'm, I I'm, I hope I answered that question. As an FQHC, is it correct we are still built, oh, 21, 2025. You know what, for that, that's actually a good question. And I hadn't wondered about that. I'm not sure if CMS is going to come out with like new policy for you on like how they want the billing done. Um, in that two-year grace period. So I actually don't know. So this is this is one of those questions of like, we're going to have to wait and see what CMS does because I, I'm wondering if they might, particularly because of the data that they're now going to have to collect because of that congressional report for that two-year period, for that two-year grace period, that might change. I mean, unless you hear differently from CMS at this point, you're probably using still using G2025. Um, but it was a question I had in my mind. It's like, oh, are they going to do different like billing instructions? So that's going to be a wait and see from CMS. Is there a limited number of telehealth visits per day for each provider? Also, can RNNs bill insurance for their telehealth services? So is there a limited number? Um, there are for skilled nursing facilities. Um, FQHCs, I don't believe there is, but you are visits per patient. There is, there is. So let me put that. So the the when you have like a limited number, it's usually for the patient on the patient end. So for skilled nursing facilities, it is like limited. I think it's like once every two weeks at this point or something like that. I can't remember that offhand. Um, and and then like for for FQs and everybody else, it's it's. It needs to be something different. It's like the usual policies that you go through and that it needs to be a different type of visit in order to justify the additional billing. So for example, I go in with um, um, a cough that's being treated and then that's done via telehealth. Um, they can do that, but then I maybe need like a mental health service at the same time and they do that at the same time. You can build those two visits. Um, so it, that's what I mean by like, there's that limit in that it, it it needs to be something different. Um, but as far as like using telehealth, um, the only thing explicit that I can think of offhand is for skilled nursing facility. Um, 
Mosin, I'm going to skip to another person's question just so I make sure I'm being fair. <laughs> Am I correct in thinking that telehealth services for medical care will be eliminated after? No, you are not correct. What what we're saying is, so Corey, am I uh, let me repeat the question so everybody knows. Uh, am I correct in thinking that telehealth services for medical care will be eliminated after 2024? In general, no. It it's not. The question is, can clinics continue to do that? And, the, and right now with the policy, the question is, no, you won't be able to, but there's been like a lot of talk on making FQHCs and RHCs eligible providers. You FQHCs and RHCs will continue post-2024 grace period um, to provide mental health services via live video and audio only, if certain conditions are met. Now, keep in mind, also for that mental health services via audio only and live video, that is specifically mental health, ser uh, mental health services. So the way CMS did that, they did not suddenly make FQHCs and RHCs telehealth providers. That requires a law change. So Congress would need to act on that. What CMS did to make that available to FQHCs and RHCs was redefine what a mental health visit meant for you guys. So you are technically, in CMS's eyes, not a telehealth provider. You're just providing a mental health visit like you normally would type of thing. You're just allowed now to use these technology options. So so that will be around. But as far as medical visits, the way the, the policy is right now, it won't disappear for, for in general being able to do that. It will disappear for FQHCs and RHCs just because of where the policies are right now. But there's been a lot of talk about like allowing FQHCs and RHCs to do it permanently in Medicare. So that could change over the next two years. And that's part of the reason I think for the two years is gives them time to possibly work on more permanent policies. Uh, what As of what date will audio only services be limited to behavioral health? Uh, right now, we're looking at uh, January 1st, 2025. Keep in mind though, again, those audio only services, that list is is uncertain right now because CMS hasn't aligned it. So so technically my answer should be like, well, we know they'll still be around 151 days after the public health emergency, just because that CMS policy hasn't aligned yet. But probably what we're looking at is January 1st, 2025. Um, we are in California. Does the new consent requirement for Medi-Cal go, still go into effect? as the bill directs on January 1st, 2023, or does it get postponed to April 11th due to the public health emergency? So for the California folks, DHCS will be coming out with their more explicit um, provider information regarding their new policies next week. They said January 16th, that's a holiday. I don't think it's gonna come out January 16th. It might come out Friday and they might get it out early, but next week they'll have like more explicit instructions about that. Um, for our behavioral health counselors are not located at all of our clinic locations. If the counselor does telehealth visits and the patient is at home, how can we meet the requirement of the six month prior and there were two months our behavioral health counselors work for their homes? Do you see that grace going away once the PHG is over? That is, you're an FQHC though. So it's the mental health visit. That's in the permanent policy. So, but, for an FQHC, that was something that CMS did in the regulatory side. My initial answer is say, no, that will probably not go away. Um, but because CMS did that on the regulatory side, they could change it. And they wouldn't have to wait for con Congress to, um, to do that because they did that on the regulatory side. So at, at this moment, no, it's it, it, it's not going to go away. There's no policy that says it'll go away, but we've got two years. It could change. Um, uh, I am trying to like find folks I have not answered questions for yet, just to, to be fair here. So I'm sorry if people feel like I might be skipping over them, but I just wanted to be fair here. Looking at the policy on the CCHP, I see that the policies was last reflected 8-2022. Are these, oh, hold on, sorry. The thing shifted on me. 
Um, what was there? Okay, also these policies reflect ACAs that we referred to. Do you have additional resources? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. If you are referring to some of the Medicaid policies, it is on a, uh, for the states, that's on a continuing, continuous updated policy, uh, updated rotation. So um, we just may not have gotten to that. So that may happen in a couple of weeks. Uh, the federal stuff, again, because that was new and actually happened when a lot of the staff and we, we were closed down for part of the holidays, we may not have had time to like update that, but it should be updated soon. All right. So getting back to questions that are still ringing. Um, is it legal for providers to do telehealth who is in a different state, whether temporary or permanently, and also can build insurance. Again, that is a licensure issue. So I'm not quite sure if you are talking about the provider being in a different state, like a provider who's licensed in California, goes to Nevada for vacation, and then sees their California patients, if you mean, is that illegal? No, in, in that scenario, okay, so in the scenario where I'm a provider, who's licensed in California, I have California patients. I go to Florida for vacation, and then I see my California patients over telehealth. That's not illegal as long as I'm licensed by California. Um, if you are talking about if the patient, is, if it's reversed, if the patient, if I'm a California provider and my patient goes to Florida, um, can I see that patient via telehealth? Is that legal? That depends on the other state, the other state laws on what they have with licensure. So it, it depends on what, what you're talking about as far as the scenario. We are in California and our FQHC and have endo that is telemedicine only. How will these uh, how will these changes, sorry, the they they address the thing shifted here. How will these changes affect the patients in the future? Is that the same as behavioral health? Endocrinology. I'm gonna assume you're talking about Medicare. Um, I mean, if you're if you're uh, what you're doing now was has been allowed during COVID nineteen, and this is Medicare that you're talking about. Again, you have your two, the two year essentially two year grace period here. If those again, if those services are going to still be allowed, I I I don't know why CMS wouldn't align it wouldn't align what Congress did for the two-year extension. So for the two-year services, that would be allowed. Um, how would these changes affect patients in the future? Again, we sound, for the most part, for a lot of this, we have this two-year grace period. So um, we'll see in two years. I'm not quite sure, is it the same behavioral health? I, I, once the, barring any change and assuming CMS aligns everything with what Congress just did a few weeks ago. Once we hit 2025 for FQHCs for Medicare, you are only going to be allowed to use audio only and live video to provide behavioral and mental health services. That's it, barring any change happening. That's, that's what's gonna happen. So if you are providing other types of clinical services right now via telehealth, because it's out underneath the PHE, it's gonna be allowed during the grace period, barring any change, policy change, once we hit January 1st, 2025, that goes away. So the question is gonna be like, what might happen for changes between that time there, between those two years? Our understanding was the provider patient had to be in the same state for telehealth services. Providers not licensed in state, California would not be able to practice. Per well, you, now you're talking about Medicaid. So I thought you were talking about Medicare policy. So now you're talking about Medicaid. So it's going to vary. Again, I go back to state policies vary from state to state, and you need to like check with the state to see what their policies are going to be. So. Um, you're talking about California. Again, California is updating their policies, and they said that they would have them out next week. So hold on and see what, what updates they have for you next week. Hopefully, I hope they send them out next week. So, But, you know, sometimes there could be a little bit of delay in that. And I think we're probably at time here, and there's no more questions. So, Philip, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, May. I really appreciate the time being able to get through those 15 to 20 questions was really insightful and we will make sure to do with our participants as we will send the recording and we will make sure to send the slides. I understand that was a lot of information to get through. 
Uh, we did in the, um, include it in the chat, but once again, we will send those out to you. Um, and then just as a final reminder, we will be closing this out and you will receive a evaluation. If you could, just please complete the evaluation. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close this out, everyone. I uh, hope you have a great year and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Bye.